As, as we're doing this, I have uh, some songs on there, and somehow that song we just heard made it on my playlist. And it also happened to come in a season where I was really just kind of struggling a bit. And I remember that song and a song we're doing later in this series both came up on times as we're walking past the house that has a nativity scene in front of their house. And ever since then, I've loved finding the houses on the route that have the nativity scenes because to remind me, that's what this season is about. And I remember listening to the words of that song and for the first time really listening to the words of that song and thinking, thinking, wow, there's something going on in this song that's significant. And I don't know if you know much about it. It was actually written by a guy named Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who was a poet. That's him. Uh, it was not a song originally. It was a poem that was later set to music. And Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was in a pretty tough spot. His first wife died and had a miscarriage. His second wife, Frances, one day was um, trying to take locks, and I guess those are the thing you did back in the 1860s, take locks of their daughter's hair and press them with wax to preserve them. Something was happening, and we're not sure what happened, if it was from the fire or the wax, but something fell on her dress, it caught fire, and she started burning. He heard her screams, rushed in from the next room, and threw himself on her to try and put out the flames. He ended up getting severely burned, and that's why the picture to, his, to the right there, he has this long white beard the rest of his life because he's burned his face and hands, and he could no longer shave. Burns were so severe, he couldn't even go to his wife's funeral. He took, as a poet, I guess, often do, he took all the things he was processing and feeling, and it just kind of found its way into his life, and it just lived there a long time. His family could see he was suffering. They could see it in his eyes, and they observed he had these long periods of silence, just quiet. The first Christmas after his wife's death, a year later, this would be 1862, this is his journal entries. How inexpressibly sad are all holidays. I can make no record of these days. Better leave them wrapped in silence. Perhaps someday God will give me peace. A Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more for me. And maybe you're in a season of life, or you know somebody that is, and the holidays just seem to magnify it. It's a tough spot to be. Almost a year later, he received word that his oldest son, Charles, who had left really without permission or his father's blessing to go serve in the Civil War. He received word that as a lieutenant in the Army of the Potomac had been severely wounded with a bullet passing under his shoulder blades and taking out one of his, uh, part of his, his spine. And now as he's processing the death of, or the, 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 not the death, but the intense wounds of his son, still mourning the loss of his second wife, He's trying to make sense of it. And although being a gift, gifted for words, trying to write things down just weren't coming so easily, and then some people believe that maybe he was sitting where he could hear the Christmas bells of a church ringing out, and he has this interaction in this song with the bells. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. And, and he, he's trying to make sense of this lack of peace, this intense pain in his life with these Christmas songs. And on Christmas Day in 1863, probably hearing these bells, he sat down and desperately tried to reflect on the joys of the season as these Christmas bells played. And he shifted his focus from grief and pain into the God who gives peace, but he wrestled with it. He was never considered a hymn writer, although the poem later was set to music by an Englishman named John Baptiste Calkin in 1872. And then in night, it's lots of different people set it to music. One of them in 1950 was a guy named Johnny Marks. You may know Johnny Marks from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. That was one of his contributions. Well, he set this poem to music, and it's a version that many of us would hear today. And the first verse of the poem and the song goes, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And what we're going to do in this series is there's a lot of times where things that are very familiar, that's dangerous. 
We can lose the significance. And as he was hearing these familiar songs of Christmas play out, there was something more happening behind the music. There was something going on behind his pain even that God was doing in his life. He says, And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then it comes to that third stanza. And actually some of the stanzas of the original poem had a lot to do with the Civil War because that was when it was written. But the ones that made it into the song were different. And the third stanza uh, he stopped by the thought of the condition of his country. The Civil War was in full swing. The Battle of Gettysburg was no more than six months previous. Days looked dark, and he must have asked himself, how can that last phrase of those stanza be true in this war-torn country, which actually seems appropriate in our day and age, in a world where it seems to lack peace, where people fight against each other? And he continues with this third stanza. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong. It mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then as each of us do, as we process pain, suffering, and the reality of life, he eventually realized that he couldn't manage pain and some of his doubts on his own. And he brings them apparently to the God who is the only one that has answers. And he shifts his focus. And this is what he writes. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. And he, these same bells that seem to be mocking his pain and highlighting his pain of losing a wife, possibly losing a son, seeing a country torn apart, and being a man who's gifted with words, he goes, I can't even make sense of it. He writes down this stanza and says, in the middle of it, maybe God's words are true. Maybe the words of the angels who showed up to the shepherds and said, hey, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That verse in Luke 2, 14, where he derives inspiration for this resolve of this poem. He doesn't create a literary contribution. He presents this offering of hope for people who are in pain, from someone who is in deep pain. And this psalm that was so familiar, it's been around for 150 years. It's not sung as much these days. But it's on my playlist because it's so significant to remind me there's always more going behind the scenes than meets the eye. It's true with this song. Some of these songs that are written have incredible stories behind them. And each week we're going to take one carol, Christmas carol, and talk about the story behind it. But on his, he found out this truth that in the darkest night, in the deepest pain, that God sometimes tips his hand. And what was previously something that mocked him and feel like, felt like it was emphasizing his pain God shows up in an unexpected way and resolves it and brings peace into his life. And maybe that's what some of us need this Christmas. I don't know if you have a Christmas playlist, but I encourage you to make one. Because with Christmas season, we'll, some of the offerings aren't that great. My, my family and I, last night, my kids each have a little Christmas tree in the room and we were decorating them and we put on Christmas music and I was, some of the songs would come on and I was like, eh, I didn't really have much to offer. Some are like, I like that song, it's fun, and sometimes that's what we want in a Christmas playlist. But what I want you to know is there are some songs that were written that have been sung for a long time, some several hundred years, that have deep significance that remind us that every time of year, but in Christmas it reminds us that God is always at work behind the scenes. There's something behind the music, there's stuff behind our lives, there's stuff behind the story and behind history. It's a reminder that there's always more going on behind the scene than meets the eye. And sometimes God tips his hand. And that's what Christmas is. The truth is that Christmas and the account of the birth of Christ reminds us there's always more going on than meets the eye. That God is work, at work behind the scenes in that story, in history, and in your life too. And sometimes when he tips his hand, it's at just the right time where you think, I can't take the pain anymore. Or I've given up hope that this world could ever be turned around. Or maybe that my life can be turned around. Or my family can be turned around. So, when you, and if you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 1. When you read the Christmas story, sometimes it's so familiar it's lost on us. Sometimes we look at a nativity scene and it just seems familiar because we've seen it before. 
But think of how obscure and random the first Christmas was. And they always start off this kind of this normal kind of normal flow of events, but then God shows that he tips his hand and said, there's more going on here in this story than meets the eye, which is good news because there's always going more, more going on in your story than meets the eye. In Luke chapter 1, Mary is told that she's going to have a baby. That happens all the time. She wasn't expecting it though. There were certain things that need to take place for her to have a baby, and they had not taken place. And God said, there's more going on here that meets the eye. And she was like, well, there's got to be, because I'm not going to be able to explain this to my parents. And then she finds out, as the angel says, God is going to make you pregnant with child, and you're going to be carrying the Messiah. And she said, hey, and just so you know that this isn't like a thing, I'm going to put someone in your family who's going to have a miracle birth as well. Your cousin Elizabeth, who's really old, shouldn't be having a baby, is pregnant as well. This is what it says, Luke 139. At that time, when she, when they, she was told that, your cousin Elizabeth's going to have a baby too, and you are too. She got ready and heard to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth, her cousin. And it says this, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. This idea of God's blessing is showing up in our world. We just finished this series called Blessed. What does it mean to have God's favor? To have the advantage that only God can give? It's always about Jesus and being related to him. And the blessing is showing up. So much so that Elizabeth says, she didn't know this at the time, but her son would grow up to be John the Baptist, a prophet, who before he's even born is leaping and saying, that's Jesus, that's the one. Can't even speak yet, but he's already saying, Something's going on. And then Elizabeth has this response. The fact that she's, God tips her hand to her. That this isn't just a miracle birth because you're older. And this isn't just a miracle birth because of Mary's circumstances. This is a miracle birth because Jesus is being born. It's who is being born is the biggest miracle here. And when she realized that she's included in God's story, she steps back and says this. But why am I so favored? I mean, who am I to be included in this story? That the mother of my Lord should come to me. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. As if he's saying, as he would say later, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed is she, Mary, who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And look, just to kind of have one little kind of comment on the word blessed and blessing. If you want to know the life God blesses, it's the one who believes God will do what he said he would do. It's for the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow who says, I'm hearing peace on earth, but I'm experiencing none of that. In my family, in my heart, in my country, it's nowhere. And then God tips his hand and says, no, God's at work here. Blessed are you for believing that God keeps his promises. In those days, it kind of continues on. Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place since Quirinius was governor of Syria. And, all went, every, and everyone went to their own town to register. It just seems like a normal thing. It seems like it's tax season. Everyone had to pay their taxes and went to see their accountant. It'd be that thing. If April 15th, a normal day where everyone's doing this government-mandated thing, process, it doesn't seem like much is going on here. But God tips his hand and says, no, no, no. I'm, moving, I'm, I'm gonna arrange something where this promise that was made hundreds of years ago that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, the town of David, because it came from his ancestry. Even though that's not his, home, his current residence. It's Nazareth. I'm going to move you to fulfill this promise by having a Roman emperor just say, we should play, pay taxes, so go to your hometown. Think about what God's doing behind the scenes here. But everyone thought, I got to go register. And road trips to the holidays are a beating, and I've got a pregnant wife that I can't even fully make sense of how she's pregnant. 
but I guess let's get, in the, let's get in the donkey and go. So here's what happens. So Joseph also went up to the town of Na- from, from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. That's God fulfilling a promise years, hundreds of years earlier where the Messiah would come from. He went there to register Mary. Again, just a government issued thing that needs to happen who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting with a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Have you ever thought about the fact that behind, you know, on your, if you're in the front of the scenes, if you're just looking at things play out, it just felt like a no vacancy sign was on. But God says, no, I need to have this stand out. Who would love a nativity scene with a hotel room, right? No, no. We need the barn. Who's going to play? What are my kids going to do? Who's going to play the shepherd in the Christmas play to make it memorable? I think it's more than that. He needed a sign to say, this is the Messiah. How many babies were born in a food trough wrapped in rags? But he says, no, I need, I, I want to place him there. Because one, it says something about the heart of Jesus, that he would be born in the most humble of circumstances. And he's about to let somebody else know, hey, you guys need to go see this. And this is how you'll know it. This will be a sign to you. It says this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. They showed up to work to take care of livestock. It was a normal day. But there was more going on behind the scenes than they could have imagined. Keeping watch over their flocks at night, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone, all around, shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy. And some of us, that's what we need. For some of us, I need peace. Some of it, it might be great joy. That's what Jesus' birth promises for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Again, God's doing something behind the scenes and he tips his hand to the shepherds and says, hey, there's probably lots of babies and stuff going on. Maybe there's multiple births in Bethlehem that night. Who knows? But don't go to the, go to the, 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 the hospital to see who's being born there. Don't even go to a hotel. Go to a food trough. Look for a kid wrapped in, 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 in cloths. That's the one. And so these shepherds that showed up to do their normal everyday work, the angels show up and say, look, Jesus is here. And you're invited to meet him. There wasn't a long invite list that night. But they were invited. And God tips his hand that there's more going on here than meets the eye. It's not a normal day. It's not a normal night. Incidentally, this all happens when the Old Testament ends. There's about a 400 year uh, gap before Jesus shows up. Where people had to be wondering, I wonder if the Messiah will ever come. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those those on whom his favor rests. All right, another way to say that is peace unto those who God blesses. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They didn't say the angels the Lord has told us about. God is always tipping his hand in your life to let you know, I'm at work behind the scenes in life and in your life. Will you pay attention? Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was hurting and in pain, still grieving in silence, the death of a wife, the serious injury of a son. And God tips his hand as at first he hears these bells and he has the same experience later with the bells and goes, no, there's something more to this. God's reminding me that he keeps his promises. This is who was born in the manger. In Isaiah 9, it says this, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hundreds of years earlier, God says, I'm going to show up. You might miss it. Be looking for it. Believe God that he'll keep his promises. And maybe one of these phrases that describes Jesus is exactly what you need this year. Maybe you need someone who is a wonderful counselor. Right now, you don't know what to do in a certain situation. 
It's good news because when Jesus showed up and made possible relationship with him, he can be our wonderful counselor. He can be our mighty God who is bigger than anything we face. He could be the everlasting father who parents you and loves you as a father loves his child. And for Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, what he needed was the Prince of Peace. Because peace was not coming through politics, through a resolve of a war, through through things happening in his family. The grieving process was stalled and stuck. He needed to, in his life, what only Jesus could do. And when Jesus was born, he was born with great purpose. John 14, 27, he tells us this. Jesus is talking to us. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. What the world wants is resolve the circumstances around me so I can have peace. Fix the world. God says, no, I want to fix us. So that's when you can truly experience peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. God desires to bring peace to our lives. But the thing is, what was true in the manger in Bethlehem, what was true in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's life 150 years ago, what's true, I believe, in every single one of our lives, is there are things happening around us, but we can miss it. Even the Christmas season where we kind of stop down and everywhere you go, you hear Christmas songs and see Christmas decorations, and they should be a reminder of what the season represents, but you can miss it. My daughter asked me a very important question about Christmas uh, this last night. She actually asked it three times this week, wanting me to explain something about Christmas because we have a very unusual decoration in our house, but it's very symbolic to me. And so I've told this story before. Some of, some of you know it, and I posted it on Instagram. Some of you saw it there. But this is our nativity scene at our house. It, it's your normal one. And we went down last night. I said, Grace, you tell me all the pieces in here. And sure enough, there's the wise men and there's the shepherds, which actually, as a historian, that bothers me because the wise men didn't show up that night. They showed up later, but that's all right. It makes for a better Christmas pageant and it makes for a better uh, uh, little nativity scene, but they did show up at Jesus' life eventually. You got Mary and Joseph and then Jesus, the baby that's there, and then the livestock and the barn, it's all there. Well, years ago, uh, before we had kids, we went to Disney World. Much better to go with kids without Disney World. Uh, I go to Disney World without kids. We were, at, uh, we're don't tell them that. We were at Disney World uh, without kids, and at Christmas time, and there were just lights everywhere. And they had this whole back lot displayed with lights, and in the middle of it, there was this manger scene. I thought, wow, isn't that amazing? Disney actually putting a nativity scene right here in the middle of all these, I think it was like nine million Christmas lights or whatever it was, and this whole block, and snow was falling in Florida, like they had a, in this machine. It was amazing. So the next day, I thought, I want to go back. I love nativity scenes. I want to go back and take a picture of it. So we show, show back up, and there it is. And the lights are all off. It's sitting by itself. And I thought, isn't this amazing? I love that it's here. And I couldn't believe it because, because people were missing, like, like walking right past it. And some people were even posing for pictures next to it with the blue Power Ranger for some reason. <laughs> and in my mind, I wondered, does Disney even own the Power Rangers? I get that they own Star Wars now and Marvel, but do they own the Power Rangers? Like, is this someone that just showed up and decided to kind of th- pose for pictures and I don't know, it's just some kind of gag. And, but, but it also, I was like, isn't this amazing that like the most important person in history is represented right behind them, but everyone wants to pose with the blue Power Ranger. And it's possible as people are running back from attraction to attraction or for a show or a dinner reservation or to get pictures with somebody, Mickey, Minnie, or the blue Power Ranger, that, that they, they don't stop and look at this nativity scene. And so in our nativity scene that we have, we now always have next to it, the blue Power Ranger. <laughs> And so this week, I had to, as we all do, our kid ask us, why do we have a blue Power Ranger in our nativity scene? Sit down, Gracia, let's have a talk about Christmas. And, and it's, the, it's the dreaded blue Power Ranger talk we all have to have with our kids, you know. <laughs> Pretty sure I'm the only one. But um, for me, I, and what I told her is this, I go, that to me, I want that there to remind me that it's possible to put up the nativity scene and miss the fact that something very important is happening here. That maybe there's a, I'm distracted with the guy on the side, there's the blue Power Ranger. And we think, well, look at that over there. And miss what's actually behind it. That what's the most important thing about Christmas is the fact that God showed up. God with us. And I said, don't miss the manger because of a blue Power Ranger standing there. Because the truth is, you can miss it. How many people in Bethlehem that night missed it? The shepherds could have missed it. They could have thought, The angels could have left and they thought, 
What was that? That was weird. I, like, do we tell our, our supervisor? Like, what, what, what do we say about this? And if we tell anybody, they won't believe us. But instead they said, let's go see what the Lord has showed us. And they went and they investigated and they saw it. See, the danger of, uh, of Christmas is going on autopilot. It, it can happen anytime. We have a na- nature of going into autopilot. Have you ever been like reading something and like maybe you're reading a book and all of a sudden you flip the page, you flip the page again and you go, I have no idea what I read the last three pages. Anyone ever done that? Yeah, it happens. Ever been driving? And it happens a lot in West Texas. You're driving and all of a sudden you go, whoa, what's happened like for the last five minutes? <laughs> Anyone ever done that? Yeah. Ever been in church and someone's talking and you're like, I don't know anything that's happened for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> Anyone ever do that? I, okay, I'm just saying, okay. I'm on you. All right. We, we have the ability to go into autopilot. Our mind just kind of shuts down and we go through the motions. That's dangerous anytime. You do that when you're reading, you could fail a test. You do it when you're driving, you could have a wreck. You do it in church, you could be called out and embarrassed by the pastor. I'm just saying, there's lots of things that can happen. Beware of autopilot. Because of what, not just what Christmas is about, but because of what Jesus is about, don't miss it. Don't miss what God might be doing behind the scenes where he tips his hand and says, I'm at work here. I have something here for you. I have something that will cause great joy, that can bring peace, that can bring purpose, can bring healing to your life. And what we want to challenge you to do in this series is this. Don't let anything keep you from engaging the God who engaged with us in the manger and engages with us every single day. Don't let your busyness, don't let your routine Don't don't let familiarity with what's going on around you. Don't let pain, don't let fear, don't let anything keep you from engaging with a God who is engaging with you. Here's the challenge we have for you this Christmas. Today, I will engage with a God who intentionally engages with me. We, We want you to think about that as a daily challenge, like in between now and the end of the year. What if every day you woke up and you made this set promise? to God and to yourself. Today, I will engage with a God who intentionally engages me. There's there's lots of ways we can do that. How we engage, even just Christmas carols, it matters. Because these songs have significance. And I'll admit, there's some that I sing just kind of on there and I just go into autopilot. I sing the songs and it's some kind of like Christmas carol karaoke. Just kind of sing it along. I like it, it makes me feel festive, but I don't connect with it. What if you actually... When you hear a Christmas carol, stop and listen to the song, what's happening behind the lyrics. What if you listen to the words and thought, what does that mean? Now, I'm not talking about the ones that talk about, you know, grandparents having incident with livestock that get run over. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about those kind or ones about snowman that put on a magic hat and danced around. Not those kind of Christmas songs. Those are fun. Those are festive. Enjoy those. But when you hear a song like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, stop and listen to the lyrics. Because what it's communicating is something so powerful. Joy to the world. That promise that was made in Luke chapter 2. This will be good news which will cause great joy for all people. What does that mean? And how does Jesus fulfill that promise in your life? And don't just do it with Christmas carols. In in this setting, if you you come here at, at, at all on a regular basis, you know that we sing these worship songs as part of our, our time together. And and don't Turn that into a spiritual karaoke where you're just going to sing along and, oh, I like this song. I'm going to sing a little bit louder. I don't like that one as much. I'm not, I'm not going to pay attention as much. Think about the words. And remember that when you're worshiping, you're not singing along with people. You're singing to your heavenly father. You're singing to the one who showed up in the manger. What is it you're trying to express to him with those words? And maybe every now and then you sing a line and go, boy, I'm in a place where that, I can't actually do that right now. I feel distant from God. Maybe you feel like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. But think about what you're singing. Think about how you engage life just each and every day. Think about how you engage with people to do that with intentionality and not go into autopilot. Because remember, God's at work all around you all the time. And some of the places he's at work are in the people around you. And every now and then he tips his hand and says, I'm doing something in their life and I want you to be a part of it. You could speak life into them right now. Would you join me in kind of what I'm doing in their life? Don't go into autopilot. 
How you engage with God as well. As a matter of fact, we want this challenge to be so seriously, we're going to give you a tool to help you with this. And on your, if you have a phone that you can change the lock screen that kind of comes up right here. Wow, I have four missed text messages. That's distracting. We have a way to um, put a lock screen on your phone and you can get it. Uh, it's available on Facebook and Instagram. Um, probably on the app. Not on the app. Go to Facebook or Instagram. Do what that says. And it will tell you how to get the lock screen. And there's four choices for you. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that on my phone. And so when, when I kind of wake up my phone, which let's, I'll just confession, it's often, I'll see that today I'll engage with a God who intentionally engages me. It's reminding me of the promise that I want to make to God and to others that I'm going to engage with God because he engaged with me. And one of the ways that we help you do that is, is through tools like this. It's through this series we want to help you do that. The other way we do it is we always have a reading plan for every series we do, and we have one for Revelation. Uh, excuse me, for this season, which includes Revelation. But, uh, so you've got a bookmark. This you can find on, on the app, on the, on, the, on the website. We always want you to be able to engage Scripture because we think when you engage with Scripture, you're not just engaging with a book. You're engaging with God and His truth. And He engages with you that way as well. But one thing we're going to have you do during this series, we're going to have you read, starting tomorrow, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and sometimes the most challenging to read, the challenging to understand. For some people, they read it and they go, I don't get it. For some people, they read it and they go, I'm fascinated. What's happening and when's it happening? Can we draw a map? Some people read it and they go, I'm scared. That's scary stuff. I want to challenge you to read through Revelation over the next two weeks as part of this reading plan, and I want to give you some tips to do that meaningfully. Here's some tips. One, anytime you read scripture, make observations. What's happening here? What do I know about this? And then turn it to application. What do I do with what I just read? The goal of reading the Bible is not to study for a test. Unless you're taking a Bible class, that's not the goal. The goal is for transformation, not just information. And so God wants to do something. So how does he want you to apply this to your life? Second, understand the original audience and the times. This was written about 95 AD, significantly about, you know, Toward the, uh, the end of uh, John, one of the disciples, his life, he was older, and he writes it to churches, seven specific churches and Christians who are living in a time in history where the church was severely persecuted by the Roman government. Like it was really, really, really bad. And he writes this to encourage them. So that's who he's writing to in a style, understand the style of literature, it's apocalyptic, it's a Jewish style of literature that uses a lot of symbolism, it's future-oriented. Uh, it uses a lot of numbers. And so because of that, you're going to read it and go, I have no idea what that means. I don't know what that image is. It's kind of scary. It's kind of interesting. It feels very Harry Potter-ish. It feels very confusing. Just understand it's a style of literature that's maybe a little bit difficult for us to read. So the next point is important. Don't get stuck on what is confusing. If, you're, if you read something and go, I don't know what that means, think about it for a little bit. See if it can help you. Sometimes it actually gives you a hint. Hey, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It'll actually flat out tell you. Hey, like the Son of Man, that means it's Jesus. That's who it is. Sometimes it won't. Some people believe it was written this way because it was almost like a code where the Roman government, they didn't know apocalyptic literature, and so they could, churches could talk to each other, and they didn't really understand what it meant. It's just a style of literature that can be confusing. Don't get stuck there. And because of that, think big picture, not timeline. If you're reading something, like you're walking along reading in Revelation, you feel like you pick something up and go, I have no idea what this image is. Fine, set it back down. And instead of looking at it on the ground level, view it as like a 35,000 foot big picture view. What is the big picture God is telling me? Because the Bible is, is 66 books written in two parts that's telling one story. The story of God and his love for us. And Revelation is the end where he says everything else is, from this, in Revelation is about here's what's going to take place soon. This is how it ends. And so if you can think about big picture, what is God telling me? And the most important thing is what does it tell you about Jesus? The very first five, uh, five words of Revelation chapter 1 is it's, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which means two things. It's from Jesus, and it is always about Jesus. He is the center point of the story. So as you're reading that, and you're thinking, does this tell me who the Antichrist is? Well, don't get confused on that. Don't get, start kind of going down YouTube video wormholes and trying to figure that out and charts, and you'll look like a JFK conspiracy theorist. 
which is what I am. And so like, you'll get really down and just step back and say, what does this tell me about Jesus? What does it tell us about how I respond to him? And what is the big picture story here? But I want you to read it because in Revelation 1.3, it tells us this. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it, not understand it, who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is here, is near. There are some things that you're gonna know God wants you to do. There are times it says, have courage. So follow God with faithfulness and courage. Figure out what he's asking you to do, take it to heart, but understand the big picture is Jesus is who he says he is and there are promises left that he has not fulfilled yet, but he says, I will keep my promises. And in the end, the last two or three chapters, he gives an image, a picture of what his ideal life is for us. And it's a place with no more pain, no more tears, no more suffering, where the bells that rang out that Henry Wadsworth uh, Longfellow heard those and thought, man, it feels like God is dead. He's not dead. He is alive. And you will one day will truly be alive as well. And all this will make sense and you will be home. And so I want to challenge you to read through Revelation uh, as we do that together. Because here's the promise that Jesus makes to us in Luke chapter 2. The angel said to them, and he says it to you as well, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. And then suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, here, Peace to those on whom his favor rests. God is crazy about you. His love for you was expressed in a manger, and it was expressed on a cross, and his identity was revealed in an empty tomb that the symbols of our faith, a manger, a cross, and an empty tomb, make possible what he talks about in Revelation, that one day we will be home and we will be a child of God at home with our Heavenly Father in a place with no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, suffering in a place where life is fully lived and expressed to the fullest. Christmas is a season. We're going to celebrate that. The next couple of weeks, we're going to look at some Christmas carols and the story behind the song and the idea that there's always more behind the story than meets the eye. And Christmas Eve, we're going to do the same thing. It's a Sunday morning, three services. Um, You actually have an opportunity to help us figure out what Christmas carols we will sing that day. So what we want to know is what Christmas carol do you want to sing at Live Oak's Christmas Eve service? You can vote. Christmas carol. No things about reindeer running over grandparents. No frosty. No 12 days of Christmas. You get the idea. Something that helps us understand the truth of God with us. We'll just say that, but I know some of you and we're going to get what we're going to get. But here's how you can vote. Find the, story, find the song poll here on the Live Oak app and on our Facebook page. You have a chance to hit a link, submit a song, and whatever gets the most votes, it'll show up on Christmas Eve. You're gonna help us plan that service. And that service is designed to be reflective for the whole family uh, from ages, what age? Kindergarten up. There'll be preschool programming that day, but kindergarten and up, we'll be here. It'll be a 45 minute service with candlelight. um, And it'll be a meaningful way to kick off our Christmas Eve day. Sound good? Let's stand for closing prayer. That was enthusiastic. I like that. Make sure you vote and please write down that phrase. Today I will engage with a God who intentionally engages at me and figure out what does that look like for you the rest of the day to engage with him? What does it look like tomorrow? I hope it includes reading Revelation chapter one. I hope it involves how you interact with people, how you pray, how you're mindful of him behind the day, asking God, how are you engaging me right now and how are you at work around me? Heavenly Father, thanks that there's always more to the story because some of our stories right now are in a tough spot. We can relate to to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in a place of pain and in need of peace. We can relate to to maybe being a place of of just, I I can't make sense of it. For some of us, we're in a good place in life and sometimes that's even harder to engage with you because life's going well. We don't feel like we need you as much. But God, wherever we are, at a high or a low or anywhere in between, God, I pray we would engage with you, the God who engaged with us at the manger, who is engaged with us before creation. God, we are grateful that you've done everything necessary to communicate who you are, how much you love us, and to make possible a relationship with you. So this week and each day, we want to engage with you, the God 
who intentionally engages with us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.